Okay. So we had talked a little bit about inverses last Friday, um, and we just talked about um, quadratics, correct? So stuff like f of x is equal to x squared, right? So um, remember when we were talking about the parent function of f of x is equal to x squared and that the domain is restricted? So we're really only talking about the positives, right? Okay, so we did our first example um, right here. f of x is equal to 1 half x squared. And then I think that's as far as we got. So why don't we do part B together? Um, f of x is equal to x squared minus 7. Can everybody see that okay? So we're finding the inverse of this function. So does anybody remember what we do when we're restric restricting the domain? So it's only when we have a quadratic. So we just are only interested in the positive x values. So we just have to say for the domain, x has to be greater than or equal to 0. And that's how we restrict it. We're only talking about the positive x values and 0. OK, so that's step 1. Step 2, we replace f of x with y. So we just rewrite that f of x and just rewrite it with y is equal to x squared minus 7, just like that. Okay. And then the very next step is we just solve, or I guess they don't switch it. So um, these directions are solving and then switching, but I like switching the variables and then solving. So I'm going to switch my variables. x is equal to y squared minus 7. So let's kick out over here. Now we're going to solve for y. How do I do that? Seven. Yep. So I'm going to add 7 to this side and add 7 to that side. So those cancel. And I get x plus 7 is equal to y squared. OK, now how do I get y alone? So I'm square rooting that side, and I'm going to square root this side. So that square root is going to cancel out the y squared, and I'm left over with y is equal to the square root of x plus 7. There's one last step that we have to do. That y isn't our original function. What is that y? It is the inverse. So we have to make sure to write that notation. So now we just rewrite it with the correct notation to make sure that whoever knows that we just found the inverse. Are we okay on that problem? So can anybody tell me why we re restrict the domain? What is the square root of 4? Mm -hmm. But remember when we square root something, like, say, the square root, well, let's just look at this problem. So when we had square rooted this right here, the square root of y is actually plus or minus the square root. Remember that, how you had to write the plus or minus square root? So when we're restricting the domain, we're saying, okay, we're not actually caring about that negative part. We only want it to be the positive part. So that's why we didn't have to do the plus or minus thing. So that's where that domain restriction comes from. Okay, and then do you guys remember the, did we do an example confirming it using composition? Nope. Okay. So there's a really cool way to check our answer. 
So if we wanted to check our answer, we just go like this. This is called composition. So confirm the inverse relationship using composition. So we found out that our inverse was equal to the square root of x plus 7. And what was my original function? f of x is equal to x squared minus 7, right? So this really cool thing happens that you can do where you just plug in your original function into the inverse. Oops. So I know that you guys haven't seen anything like this before. So what exactly did I do there? Can anybody explain that? So you know how typically if I said we have a, a certain function. So let's say f of x is equal to x squared. And I told you guys x is equal to 4. What would you do? Yeah, so you're plugging that value into your function like that. So you're plugging your x into your function. Well, what we're doing, we're doing that same thing except for we're just plugging a function into a function. So we plugged this into our function and we're treating this like it's x, but it's actually a little bit more than x, but we're treating it just like it's x. So what's going to happen is, so let's try and do this. So I have my function. Um, my inverse function is the square root of x plus 7. But remember, our x is this part. So we're plugging that in. So I get x squared minus 7. Well, if I simplify this, it's going to turn into x squared. What's negative 7 plus 7? Zero. Yeah. So I have the square root of x squared. What's that? What's that equal to? X. It's just equal to x. Guess what? Every single time you plug in your original function into your new function, you're going to get x. And that's how you check using composition. So we'll do more examples. Do you guys kind of see, just on that first try, kind of what's happening? So we're just treating a function as if it was x and plugging it in to this new x, our inverse x. So let's try it on that example that we did, the very first one, that part a. Or I think I might have another example on here too. Um, oh, here's another one. Okay, so restrict the domain of each quadratic function and find its inverse. Convert or confirm inverse relationship using composition and graph and graph the function and its inverse. And we're not going to wor worry about right at this moment the graphing because that's going to be the next section. So let's first find the inverse of this function. How do I do that? That's my first step. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just going to rewrite it, and then I'm going to switch my x and y. So then I get x is equal to 3y squared. Now I just need to solve for y. So I'm going to divide by 3 on one side and the other. So I'm left over with x divided by 3 is equal to y squared. How do I get rid of a y squared? How do I get rid of the square? Mm -hmm. Square with that side and square with the other side. So I'm left over with y is equal to the square root of x divided by 3. And I have one more step to show that that is my inverse. So I have to say, this is my inverse that I just found. So I'm going to write my inverse notation. Um, oh, I forgot something really important. We have to say our domain. So yeah, greater than or equal to 0. Got to restrict that domain. 
okay, so how do I find, now we need to find the composition to confirm. So I'm going to take my inverse, and I'm going to plug my original function into that inverse. So here's my original function. So we're going to treat this like x, remember, and we're going to plug it in to that x. So what you're going to have is the square root of, what's my, what's my x? Yep, so I'm going to plug 3x squared in for x and divide that by 3. We are going to see every time stuff's going to work out, so that would cancel, and what you're left over with is x squared. Squared of x squared is x. So we just confirmed using composition. So you, in your notes, make sure that you have the inverse of your function and say something like this is composition. Make sense? It's not too hard, is it? <clears throat> okay, you guys. Or is that all I have? I think that's all I have. Okay, so then the next thing, did we talk about cubics? A little bit. So the next part of this, so we were just doing quadratics, right? So um, anything to the exponent of 2. So squared. So now we're doing cubics. So does anybody remember what the parent function of a cubic is? Mm -hmm. So the parent function, <clears throat> excuse me, of a cubic is f of x is equal to x cubed. Does anybody remember what this looks like graphically? Yep, the John Travolta. How does that go? It goes something like that, right? So these actually don't have a restricted domain. We're actually concerned about those negative numbers. So we don't have a restriction on the domain of x cubed. And does anybody remember the inverse, what line it's reflected over? Same as quadratics. So I'm going to tell you it's reflected over this line. What is, yep. So what is that line? y is equal to x. So the inverse is a reflection over the line y is equal to x. So the inverse is going to look something like this. So this is my inverse. Nope, that's so. The inverse of the line of the function x cubed is reflected over the line y equals x, because y equals x is just a slope of 1. So it's a reflection over this line. Um, no, it's always over that. Yep, so that's just, this is just notation, right? So um, the inverse is just written like this. So we're just talking about graphically what's happening. This isn't a specific problem where we're finding an inverse. So this is the inverse of the parent function. Cool. 
For those of you who are on your phones, you can get off your phones, please. I don't want to see phones out on tables unless we're using them for math. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at this problem here. A. So we have to find each inverse. And let's just pull it out over here. So our problem was f of x is equal to 1 half x cubed. All right. So it's the same exact method. So I'm just going to rewrite it with a y. Switch my x and y. And solve for y. So how do I get rid of a 1 half times it by 2? So I have 2x is equal to y cubed. How do I get a y cubed to get y alone? Get rid of that cube. Mm -hmm. Cube root it. So the cubes go away. And y is equal to the cube root of 2x. Now I have to show that that was my inverse function. And I found my inverse. So now we have to confirm, confirm this using composition. How do I find the composition? I plug f of x into my inverse. Okay. So my inverse is the cubed root of 2 times, this is what I plug in, 1 half x cubed. And the 2 times 1 half cancels, and you're left with the cubed root x cubed, which is equal to x. So you know you did it right. What's that? Uh-huh, so that's a cubed root. Mm -hmm. Good question. Because um, when we take the square root, there's an imaginary 2 right there. We just don't write it. So when we're taking the cubed root, we have to write the 3. Alrighty. Let's do one more of those. Um, f of x is equal to x cubed minus 9. So I'm going to switch my f of x to y and rewrite. Now I'm going to switch my x's and y's and solve for y. And now how do I get rid of y cubed? How do I cancel out that cubed? Cubed root it, right? So y is equal to the cubed root of x plus 9. Nope. So you could do cubed root of x plus 3. But that would be the only thing you could do. Mm. I see what you're saying. You're right. 3 squared is 9. You confuse me. Okay, so composition. I'm going to plug this in for x. So the cubed root of x cubed minus 9 plus 9. So you end up with the cubed root of x cubed, which is equal to x. Okay.
that's pretty much 10.1. Not that bad, right? Okay. Let's see, do I have it? So I just have some more examples, but I think that we're pretty good on those. So 10.2 is just graphing these square root functions. So we just finished um, mod 9. Mod 9 was about rational functions, right? And we had learned stuff like asymptotes and holes and everything like that. And we had learned the form um, like this, right? Where there were transformations. Oops. And what were those trans transformations? <coughs> we went up k, and then what was h? Right h, right? Right h units. So just like we had learned on stuff like rationals, or even if we had like, we were just talking about um, exponentials, if I had x plus 2 squared minus 3, what would that be? That would be down 3 and left 2, right? So you see how it's kind of all similar throughout every type of function that we've talked about this year? So it's going to be the same exact thing when we're talking about square root functions. So here's our parent function of a square root function. f of x is equal to the square root of x. This is our parent function. So we're going to have the same transformations. If it's inside, it's the horizontal shift. If it's outside, it's the vertical. So k is always our vertical shift. And h is always our horizontal shift. So what we're looking at right now on the board, this is just um, a table of values. So for the parent function, if you plug in 0, your output is 0. If you plug in 1, it's the square root of 1, so your output is 1. Okay, so... The reference points, I'm just looking at this paragraph right here. The reference points can be found by recognizing that the initial point of the graph is translated from 0, 0 to h, comma, k, which are your transformations. So let me read that again. The reference points can be found by recognizing that the initial point of the graph is translated from the origin to a new point, your transformation point, h comma k. From that initial point, you can find the next reference point by going up or down by um, a positive a or left and right by a positive b, depending on the parameter used and its sign. So let's try an example. Okay. For each of the transformed square root functions, find the transformed reference points and use them to plot the transformed function on the same graph with the parent function. Describe the domain and range using set notation. Okay, so let's talk about some transformations that we see.
Yep, so let's just do maybe the horizontal and, yeah. yep, so we're going down two and right three, right three. Okay, and how did you know that? Because it's it looks exactly the same as, yeah. Okay, so what would my domain be? Or do you guys know what the parent function of just a square root looks like? Have you guys ever learned that? Probably. So it ends up, um, you can always do a table of values. So if it's ever like the ACT or anything like that and they ask you, what is the shape? Like sketch the shape. You can always just plug in numbers to a table. So let's do um, x and f of x. And what if we plug in 0 so our function is f of x is equal to the square root of x? So the square root of 0 is 0. What if we plug in 1? 1. What if we plug in 4? So it's the square root of 4. What do you say? Square root of 4, right? Because we're plugging in 4 for... Um, so it's 2. And then, so I'm picking values that are like easy to take the square root of. So 16, square root of 16, 4. So it's going to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and then all the way up, whatever, 16 is just up 4. So your parent function ends up being this little kind of swoop curve, and it's just going to look like this. Have you guys ever seen that? Yeah. So if I were to sketch it really quick, it's something like that. Was on it or not? Okay. So just like um, that last example, you can always plug in values to sketch your curve. So what is my domain going to be? So we actually, but since we're going right three, what do you think? Yep. Okay. And then... The range, we're going down to, so negative 2, perfect. Okay, so now we have to graph this function. So we have, do you guys want to plug in, so g of x is equal to, to so we can make a table of values so what happens if we plug in zero or we can't because we have to we have to be greater than three so let's start by plugging in three You get two. Okay, what should the next number we do be? Should we do four? Negative two? Should we do, what should our next x value be? So you want, to, you want it to end up nice. So... Square root, do you have any ideas? What should we do for our next x value that we get a nice number? We don't, so what could give us not a square root? That's what I'm looking for. Five. So five minus three is two. That would be the square root of two. Eight. Six. No. Seven. Seven. So let's, let's well, get the square root of seven. four. So let's put seven in. <laughs> okay, so the square root of 4 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 minus 2 is 2. 
So what could be another good number to put in? So to x, so 12. Twelve minus three is nine. So the square root of nine is three times two is six. Six minus two is four. Good one. So this is, those are some pretty good values. So if we were to graph this, we would get three down two and seven up two, and then. 12 up 4. So our function looks just like that. So is the domain going to be where it crosses the x axis? No. So I found my domain with my shifts. So we were right three and down two. So um, typically your domain has to be, um, your domain is greater than or equal to zero and your range is greater than or equal to zero, right? So if I shifted that, my original domain, right three, then it's going to be greater than or equal to three. You get that? Yeah. And so let's check this out after we did our um, our table of values. So we went right three, so over one, two, three, and down two, down two. So you can use the origin to find your first reference point, right? So you can use your shifts to find your first reference point and the origin. And then to find your second reference point, what were they saying? To find the next reference point, you go up or down A, where A is the number out front, and then you go left or right by B, okay, um, depending on the sign. So B is this number out front, and A is out very front. So our B is just 1. So there's no number in front of that x, which means it's 1. So this would be your b, and this would be your a. So they're saying you can find the second point by going right 2 and over 1. Uh, where's my graph? So we would go right or up two and over one. So it would go right through that, even though that's not a point that we found. Okay. So let's do another example. Okay, so what are a few of my, what's my horizontal and vertical shift? Just looking at this one. Okay. Up one, right two. So do we have a point right away? Because if we're going, if we know we're going right two, we know a point's going to be over two, up one, right? So that's one of our reference points. First reference point. How do we find our second reference point? So this is where you use your A and B that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So your, let's go back up to this. So your A is the number out front, and this is up or down, up or down A and right or left B. Okay, so we have, this is A, whoops. And this number is B. So we're going 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and B is um, going to be in fraction form. So do you see how this B? So we're actually talking about the number on the bottom. So if you see something like we had negative 1, 2, it's going to be, yes, just negative 2, and um, that's we're going to be going left 2, okay? So up or down A, left or right B. Oops. Down, down, down. Okay. So since it's a positive 1, um, we're going up 1 because... A tells us up or down, so A gives us up or down, and B tells us left or right, and it's the number in the bottom. So we have a negative 2 in the bottom, so it's left 2 and up 1 from that last point. So let's find, let's see here. Just sketch a graph. Our first reference point is 2, 1, right? That's the easy one. And then from there, then we can go up 1, 2. So up 1 and back 2. So this function is actually going to go backwards like that. So our first reference point, and then your second reference point. So what is our second reference point? 0, 2? Does that make sense? OK. Should we do one more problem? No? OK. It's pretty easy, right? It's not that hard. All right. <clears throat>